Chapter 10 Secrets Ignoring her companions for a moment, Egwene Alvear stood in her stirrups hoping for a glimpse of Tar Valen in the distance, but all she could see was something indistinct, gleaming white in the morning sunlight. It had to be the city on the island, though, the lone broken-topped mountain called Dragon Mount, rising out of the rolling plain, had first appeared on the horizon late the afternoon before, and that lay just this side of the river Aranen from Tarvalen. It was a landmark, that mountain, one jagged fang sticking up out of rolling flatlands, easily seen for many miles, easy to avoid, as all did, even those who went to Tarvalen. Dragon Mount was where Luz Theron Kinslayer had died, so it was said, and other words had been spoken of the mountain, prophecy and warning, rich reasons to stay away from its black slopes. She had reason not to stay away, and more than one. Only in Tarvalen could she find the training she needed, the training she had to have. I will never be collared again. She pushed the thought away, but it came back turned end about. I will never lose my freedom again. In Tarvalen, Anaya would resume testing her dreams. The Aes Sedai would have to, though she had found no real evidence that Egwene was a dreamer, as Anaya suspected. Egwene's dreams had been troubling since leaving Almuth Plain, aside from dreams of the Shan Chan, and those still made her wake sweating, she dreamed more and more of Rand, Rand running, running towards something but running away from something too. She peered harder toward Tarvalen. Anaya would be there, and Kalad too, perhaps. She blushed in spite of herself and banished him from her mind entirely. Think about the weather. Think about anything else. Light, but it feels warm. This early in the year, with winter only yesterday's memory, white still capped Dragon Mount, but here below the snows were melted. Early shoots poked through the matted brown of last year's grasses, and where trees topped the low hill here and there, the first red of new growth was showing. After a winter spent traveling, sometimes trapped in village or camp for days by storms, sometimes covering less ground between sunrise and sunset, with snowdrifts belly deep on the horses, than she could have walked by noon in better weather, it was good to see signs of spring. Sweeping her thick wool cloak back out of her way, Egwene let herself drop down in the high cantled saddle and smoothed her skirts in a gesture of impatience. Her dark eyes filled with distaste. She had worn the dress, divided for riding by her own skill with a needle, for far too long, but the only other she had was even more grubby. And the same color, the dark gray of the leashed ones. The choice all those weeks ago on beginning their ride to Tarvalen had been dark gray or nothing. I swear I will never wear gray again, Bella, she told her shaggy mount, patting the mare's neck. Not that I'll have much choice once we're back in the White Tower, she thought. In the tower, all novices wore white. Are you talking to yourself again? Nynaeve asked, pulling her bay gelding closer. The two women were of a height as well as dressed alike, but the difference in their horses put the former wisdom of Emmons Field a head taller. Nynaeve frowned now and tugged at the thick braid of dark hair hanging over her shoulder, the way she did when worried or troubled, or sometimes when she was preparing to be particularly stubborn even for her. A great serpent ring on her finger marked her as one of the accepted, not yet Aes Sedai, but a long step closer than Egwene. Better you should be keeping watch. Egwene held her tongue on the retort that she had been watching for Tarvalen. Did she think I was standing in my stirrups because I do not like my saddle? Nynaeve seemed to forget too often that she was not the wisdom of Emmons Field any longer, and Egwene was no longer a child. But she wears the ring and I do not, yet, and for her that means nothing has changed. Do you wonder how Moiraine is treating Lan? she asked sweetly, and had a moment of pleasure at the sharp jerk Nynaeve gave her braid. The pleasure faded quickly, though. Wounding remarks did not come naturally to her, and she knew Nynaeve's emotions concerning the warder were like skeins of yarn after a kitten had gotten into the knitting basket. But Lan was no kitten, 
and Nynaeve would have to do something about the man before his stubborn, stupid nobility made her mad enough to kill him. They were six altogether, all plainly dressed enough not to stand out in the villages and small towns they had encountered, yet perhaps as odd a party as had crossed the Caroline grass any time recently, four of them women, and one of the men in a litter slung between two horses. The litter horses carried light packs as well, with supplies for the long stretches between villages the way they had come. Six people, Egwene thought, and how many secrets. They all shared more than one, secrets that would have to be kept, perhaps, even in the White Tower. Life was simpler back home. Nynaeve, do you think Rand is all right? And Perrin? she added hastily. She could not afford to pretend any longer that one day she would marry Rand. Pretending would be all it was now. She did not like that. She was not entirely reconciled to it, but she knew it. Your dreams? Have they been troubling you again? Nynaeve sounded concerned, but Egwene was in no mood to accept sympathy. She made her voice sound as everyday as she could manage. From the rumors we heard, I can't tell what might be going on. They have everything I know about so twisted, so wrong. Everything has been wrong since Moiraine came into our lives, Nynaeve said brusquely. Perrin and Rand, she hesitated, grimacing. Egwene thought Nynaeve believed everything that Rand had become was Moiraine's doing. They will have to take care of themselves for now. I'm afraid we have something to worry about ourselves. Something is not right. I can feel it. Do you know what? Egwene asked. It feels almost like a storm. Nynaeve's dark blue eyes studied the morning sky, clear and blue, with only a few scattered white clouds, and she shook her head again like a storm coming. Nynaeve had always been able to foretell the weather, listening to the wind it was called, and the wisdom of every village was expected to do it, though many really could not. Yet since leaving Emmons Field, Nynaeve's ability had grown or changed. The storms she felt sometimes had to do with men rather than wind now. Egwene bit her underlip, thinking. They could not afford to be stopped or slowed, not after coming so far, not so close to Tarvalin. For Matt's sake, and for reasons that her mind might tell her were more important than the life of one village youth, one childhood friend, but that her heart could not rate so high. She looked at the others, wondering if any of them had noticed something. Varen Sedai, short and plump and all in shades of brown, rode apparently lost in thought, the hood of her cloak pulled forward till it all but hid her face, in the lead but letting her horse amble at its own pace. She was of the brown Aja, and the brown sisters usually cared more for seeking out knowledge than for anything in the world around them. Egwene was not so sure of Varen's detachment, though. Varen had put herself hip-deep in the affairs of the world by being with them. Elaine, of an age with Egwene and also a novice, but golden-haired and blue-eyed where Egwene was dark, rode back beside the litter where Matt lay unconscious. In the same gray as Egwene and Nynaeve, she was watching him with the worry they all felt. Matt had not roused in three days now. The lean, long-haired man riding on the other side of the litter seemed to be trying to look everywhere without anyone noticing, and the lines of his face had deepened in concentration. Huron, Egwene said, and Nynaeve nodded. They slowed to let the litter catch up to them. Varen ambled on ahead. Do you sense something, Huron? Nynaeve asked. Elaine lifted her eyes, suddenly intent, from Matt's litter. With the three of them looking at him, the lean man shifted in his saddle and rubbed the side of his long nose. Trouble, he said, curt and reluctant at the same time. I think maybe trouble. A thief-taker for the King of Shinar, he did not wear a Shinaran warrior's topknot, yet the short sword and notched sword-breaker at his belt were worn with use. Years of experience seemed to have given him some talent at sniffing out wrongdoers, especially those who had done violence. Twice on the journey he had advised them to leave a village after being there less than an hour. The first time they had all refused, saying they were too tired, but before the night was done, the innkeeper and two other men of the village had tried to murder them in their beds. 
They were only simple thieves, not dark friends, just greedy for the horses and whatever they had in their saddlebags and bundles. But the rest of the village knew of it, and apparently considered strangers fair gleanings. They had been forced to flee a mob waving axe handles and pitchforks. The second time Varen ordered them to ride on as soon as Huron spoke. But the thief-taker was always wary when talking to any of his companions, except Matt, back when Matt could talk. The two of them had joked and played at dice when the women were not too close at hand. Egwene thought he might be uneasy at being alone for all practical purposes with an eyes Sedai and three women in training for sisterhood. Some men found facing a fight easier than facing eyes Sedai. What kind of trouble? Elaine said. She spoke easily, but with such a clear note of expecting to be answered immediately and in detail that Huron opened his mouth. I smell... He cut himself short and blinked as if surprised, eyes darting from one woman to another. Just a feeling, he said finally. A... a hunch. I've seen some tracks, yesterday and today, a lot of horses, twenty or thirty going this way, twenty or thirty that. It makes me wonder. That's all. A feeling. But I say it's trouble. Tracks? Egwene had not noticed them. Nynaeve said sharply, I did not see anything worrisome in them. Nynaeve prided herself on being as good a tracker as any man. They were days old. What makes you think they are trouble? I just think they are, Huron said slowly, as if he wanted to say more. He dropped his eyes, rubbing at his nose and inhaling deeply. It's been a long time since we saw a village, he muttered. Who knows what news from Falma has come before us. We might not find so good a welcome as we expect. I'm thinking these men could be brigands, killers. We should be wary, I'm thinking. If Matt was on his feet, I'd scout ahead, but maybe it's best I don't leave you alone. Nynaeve's eyebrows lifted. Do you believe we can not look after ourselves? The one power won't do you much good if somebody kills you before you can use it, Huron said, addressing the tall pommel of his saddle. Begging your pardon, but I think I... I'll just ride up with Varen Sedai for a time. He dug in his heels and galloped forward before any of them could speak again. Now that is a surprise, Elaine said as Huron slowed a little distance from the brown sister. Varen did not seem to notice him any more than she noticed anything else, and he appeared content to leave it so. He has been staying as far from Varen as he could ever since we left Toman Head. He always looks at her as if he's afraid of what she might say. Respecting Aes Sedai doesn't mean he is not afraid of them, Nynaeve said, then added reluctantly, of us. If he thinks there might be trouble, we ought to send him out scouting. Egwene took a deep breath and gave the other two women as level a look as she could manage. If there is trouble, we can defend ourselves better than he could with a hundred soldiers to help him. He doesn't know that, Nynaeve said flatly, and I'm not about to tell him, or anyone else. I can imagine what Varen would have to say about it, Elaine sounded anxious. I wish I had some idea how much she does know. Egwene, I don't know if my mother could help me if the Amalin found out, much less help the pair of you, or even whether she would try. Elaine's mother was Queen of Andor. She was only able to learn a little of the power before she left the White Tower, for all she has lived as if she had been raised to full sister. We cannot hope to rely on more gaze, Nynaeve said. She is in Camelin, and we will be in Tar Valen. No, we may be in enough trouble already for going off as we did, no matter what we've brought back. It will be best if we stay low, behave humbly, and do nothing to attract more attention than we already have. Another time Egwene would have laughed at the idea of Nynaeve pretending to be humble. Even Elaine managed a better job of it. But at present she did not feel like laughing. And if Huron is right, if we are attacked, he cannot defend us against twenty or thirty men, and we might be dead if we wait for Varen to do something. You said you sense a storm, Nynaeve. You do? Elaine said. Red gold curls swung as she shook her head. Varen will not like it if we... She trailed off. Whatever Varen likes or doesn't like, we may have to. 
I will do what must be done, Nynaeve said sharply, if there is anything to be done, and you two will run if need be. The White Tower may be all abuzz with your potential, but don't think they will not still you both if the Armorland's seat or the Hall of the Tower decides it is necessary. Elaine swallowed hard. If they would still us for it, she said in a faint voice, they would still you, too. We should all run together, or act together. Huron has been right before. If we want to live to be in trouble in the Tower, we may have to to do what we must. Egwene shivered, stilled, cut off from Saidar, the female half of the true source. Few Eyes Sedai had ever incurred that penalty, yet there were deeds for which the tower demanded stilling. Novices were required to learn the names of every Eyes Sedai who had ever been stilled and their crimes. She could always feel the source there, now, just out of sight, like the sun at noon over her shoulder. If she often caught nothing when she tried to touch Saidar, she still wanted to touch it. The more she touched it, the more she wanted to, all the time. No matter what Shiriam Sadai, the mistress of novices, said about the dangers of growing too fond of the feel of the One Power. To be cut off from it, still able to sense Saidar, but never to touch it again. Neither of the others seemed to want to talk, either. To cover her shaking, she bent from her saddle to the gently swaying litter. Matt's blankets had become disarrayed, exposing a curved dagger in a golden sheath clutched in one hand, a ruby the size of a pigeon's egg capping the hilt. Careful not to touch the dagger, she eased the blankets back over his hand. He was only a few years older than she, but gaunt cheeks and sallow skin had aged him. His chest barely moved as he breathed hoarsely. A lumpy leather sack lay at his feet. She shifted the blanket to cover that, too. We have to get Matt to the tower, she thought. And the sack. Nynaeve leaned down as well and felt Matt's forehead. His fever is worse, she sounded worried. If only I had some worry not root or fever bane. Perhaps if Varen tried healing again, Elaine said. Nynaeve shook her head. She smoothed Matt's hair back and sighed then straightened before speaking. She says it is all she can do to keep him alive now, and I believe her. I... I tried healing last night myself, but nothing happened. Elaine gasped. Shiriam Sadai says we mustn't try to heal until we've been guided step by step a hundred times. You could have killed him, Egwene said sharply. Nynaeve sniffed loudly. I was healing before I ever thought of going to Tar Valen, even if I didn't know I was. But it seems I need my medicines to make it work for me. If I only had some fever bane, I do not think he has much time left. Hours, maybe. Egwene thought she sounded almost as unhappy about knowing, about how she knew, as she did about Matt. She wondered again why Nynaeve had chosen to go to Tar Valen for training at all. She had learned to channel unknowingly, even if she could not always control the act, and had passed the crisis that killed three out of four women who learned without Aes Sedai guidance. Nynaeve said she wanted to learn more, but often she was as reluctant about it as a child being dosed with sheep's tongue root. We will have him in the White Tower soon, Egwene said. They can heal him there. The Amarlin will take care of him. She will take care of everything. She did not look at where Matt's blanket covered the sack at his feet. The other two women were studiously not looking at it either. There were some secrets they would all be relieved to shed. Writers, Nynaeve said suddenly, but Egwene had already seen them. Two dozen men appearing over a low rise ahead, white cloaks flapping as they galloped, angling toward them. Children of the light, Elaine said like a curse, I think we have found your storm and Huron's trouble. Varen had pulled up, a hand on Huron's arm to stop him drawing his sword. Egwene touched the lead litter horse to stop it just behind the plump Aes Sedai. Let me do all the talking, children, the Aes Sedai said placidly, pushing her cowl back to reveal grey in her hair. Egwene was not sure how old Varen was. She thought old enough to be a grandmother, but the gray streaks were the Aes Sedai's only signs of age. And whatever you do, 
do not allow them to make you angry. Varen's face was as calm as her voice, but Egwene thought she saw the Aes Sedai measuring the distance to Tar Valen. The tops of the towers were visible now, and a high bridge arching over the river to the island, tall enough for the trading ships that plied the river to sail beneath. Close enough to see, Egwene thought, but too far to do any good. For a moment she was sure the oncoming white cloaks meant to charge them, but their leader raised a hand and they abruptly drew rein a scant forty paces off, scattering dust and dirt ahead of them. Nynaeve muttered angrily under her breath, and Elaine sat straight and full of pride, appearing likely to berate the white cloaks for ill manners. Huron still had a grip on his sword hilt. He looked ready to put himself between the women and the white cloaks, no matter what Varen said. Varen mildly waved a hand in front of her face to dispel the dust. The white-cloaked riders spread out in an arc, blocking the way firmly. Their breastplates and conical helmets shone from polishing, and even the mail on their arms gleamed brightly. Each man had the flaring golden sun on his breast. Some fitted arrows to bows, which they did not raise but held ready. Their leader was a young man, yet he wore two golden knots of rank beneath the sunburst on his cloak. Two tar Valen witches, unless I miss my guess, yes, he said with a tight smile that pinched his narrow face. Arrogance brightened his eyes, as if he knew some truth others were too stupid to see. And two nits and a pair of lapdogs, one sick and one old. Huron bristled, but Varen's hand restrained him. Where do you come from? the white cloak demanded. We come from the west, Varen said placidly. Move out of our way and let us continue. The children of the light have no authority here. The children have authority wherever the light is, witch, and where the light is not we bring it. Answer my questions, or must I take you to our camp and let the questioners ask? Matt could not afford any more delay in reaching help in the White Tower. And more importantly, Egwene winced to think of it that way, more importantly, they could not let the contents of that sack fall into White Cloak hands. I have answered you, Varen said, still calm, and more politely than you deserve. Do you really believe you can stop us? Some of the white cloaks raised their bows as if she had uttered a threat, but she went on, her voice never rising. In some lands you may hold sway by your threats, but not here, in sight of Tar Valen. Can you truly believe that in this place you will be allowed to carry off Aes Sedai? The officer shifted uneasily in his saddle, as though suddenly doubting whether he could back up his words. Then he glanced back at his men, either to remind himself of their support, or because he had remembered they were watching, and with that he took himself in hand. I have no fear of your dark friend ways, witch. Answer me or answer the questioners. He did not sound as forceful as he had. Varen opened her mouth as if for idle conversation, but before she could speak, Elaine jumped in, voice ringing with command. I am Elaine, daughter heir of Andor. If you do not move aside at once, you will have Queen Morgays to answer to, White Cloak. Varen hissed with vexation. The White Cloak looked taken aback for an instant, but then he laughed. You think it's so, yes? Perhaps you will discover Morgays no longer has so much love for witches, girl. If I take you from them and return you to her side, she will thank me for it. Lord Captain Eamon Valda would like very much to speak to you, daughter heir of Andor. He raised a hand. Whether to gesture or signal his men, Egwene could not say. Some of the white cloaks gathered their reins. There's no more time to wait, Egwene thought. I will not be chained again. She opened herself to the one power. It was a simple exercise, and after long practice it went much more swiftly than the first time she had tried. In a heartbeat, her mind emptied of everything, everything but a single rosebud floating in emptiness. She was the rosebud opening to the light, opening to Saidar, the female half of the true source. The power flooded her, threatening to sweep her away. It was like being filled with light, with the light like being one with the light, a glorious ecstasy. She fought to keep from being overwhelmed and focused on the ground in front of the white cloak officer's horse, a small patch of ground, 
she did not want to kill anyone. You will not take me. The man's hand was still going up. With a roar, the ground in front of him erupted in a narrow fountain of dirt and rocks higher than his head. Screaming, his horse reared, and he rolled out of his saddle like a sack. Before he hit the ground, Egwene shifted her focus closer to the other white cloaks, and the ground threw up another small explosion. Bella danced sideways, but she controlled the mare with reins and knees without even thinking of it. Wrapped inside emptiness, she was still surprised at a third eruption, not of her making, and a fourth. Distantly she was aware of Nynaeve and Elaine, both enveloped in the glow that said they too had embraced Saidar, had been embraced by it. That aura would not be visible to any but another woman who could channel, but the results were visible to all. Explosions harried the white cloaks on every side, showering them with dirt, shaking them with noise, sending their horses plunging wildly. Huron stared around him, mouth open and obviously as frightened as the white cloaks, as he tried to keep the litter horses and his own mount from bolting. Varen was wide-eyed with astonishment and anger. Her mouth worked furiously, but whatever she might be saying was lost in the thunder. And then the white cloaks were running away, some dropping their bows in panic, galloping as if the Dark One himself were at their backs. All but the young officer, who was picking himself up off the ground. Shoulders hunched, he stared at Varen, the whites of his eyes showing all the way round. Dust stained his fine white cloak and his face, but he did not seem to notice. Kill me then, witch, he said shakily. Go ahead, kill me as you killed my father. The eyes Sedai ignored him. Her attention was all on her companions. As if they too had forgotten their officer, the fleeing white cloaks vanished over the same rise where they had first appeared, all in a body and none looking back. The officer's horse ran with them. Under Varen's furious gaze, Egwene let go of Saidar slowly, unwillingly. It was always hard letting go. Even more slowly, the glow around Nynaeve vanished, Nynaeve was frowning hard at the pinch-faced white cloak before them, as if he might still be capable of some sort of trickery. Elaine looked shocked by what she had done. What do you have done? Varen began, then stopped to take a deep breath. Her stare took in all three of the younger women. What you have done is an abomination. An abomination! And Aes Sedai does not use the power as a weapon except against Shadow Spawn, or in the last extreme to defend her life. The three oaths. They were ready to kill us, Nynaeve broke in heatedly. Kill us or carry us off to be tortured. He was giving the order. It. it was not really using the power as a weapon, Varen Sedai. Elaine held her chin high, but her voice shook. We did not hurt anyone or even try to hurt anyone. Surely do not split hairs with me, Varen snapped. When you become full Aes Sedai, if you ever become full Aes Sedai, you will be bound to obey the three oaths, but even novices are expected to do their best to live as if already bound. What about him? Nynaeve gestured to the white cloak officer, still standing there and looking stunned. Her face was as tight as a drum, she seemed almost as angry as the eyes said I. He was about to take us prisoner. Matt will die if he doesn't reach the tower soon, and... And... Egwene knew what Nynaeve was struggling not to say aloud. And we can't let that sack fall into any hands but the Amerlins. Varen regarded the white cloak wearily. He was only trying to bully us, child. He knew very well he could not make us go where we did not want not without more trouble than he was willing to accept, not here, not in sight of Tar Valen. I could have talked us past him, with a little time and a little patience. Oh, he might well have tried to kill us if he could have done it from hiding, but no white cloak with the brains of a goat will try harming an Aes Sedai, who knows he is there. See what you have done. What stories will those men tell, and what harm will it do? The officer's face had reddened when she mentioned hiding. It is no cowardice not to charge the powers that broke the world, he burst out. You witches want to break the world again in the service of the Dark One. 
Varen shook her head in tired disbelief. Egwene wished she could mend some of the damage she had done. I am very sorry for what I did, she told the officer. She was glad she was not bound to speak no word that was not true as full eyes said I were, because what she had said was only half true at best. I should not have, and I apologize. I am sure Varen said I will heal your bruises. He stepped back as if she had offered to have him skinned alive, and Varen sniffed loudly. We have come a long way, Egwene went on, all the way from Tomon Head, and if I weren't so tired I would never have... Be quiet, girl, Varen shouted at the same time the white cloak snarled. Tomon Head? Falma? You were at Falma? He stumbled back another step and half drew his sword. From the look on his face... Egwene did not know whether he meant to attack or to defend himself. Huron moved his horse closer to the white cloak, a hand on his sword breaker, but the narrow faced man went on in a rant, spittle flying with his fury. My father died at Falma. Bayar told me, You witches killed him for your false dragon. I'll see you dead for it. I will see you burn. Impetuous children, Varen sighed almost as bad as boys for letting your mouths run away with you. Go with the light, my son, she told the white cloak. Without another word, she guided them around the man, but his shouts followed after. My name is Dane Bornhold. Remember it, dark friends. I will make you fear my name. Remember my name. As Bornhold's shouts faded behind them, they rode in silence for a time. Finally, Egwene said to no one in particular, I was only trying to make things better. Better, Varen muttered. You must learn there is a time to speak all of the truth and a time to govern your tongue. The least of the lessons you must learn, but important, if you mean to live long enough to wear the shawl of a full sister. Did it never occur to you that word of Falma might have come ahead of us? Why should it have occurred to her? Nynaeve asked. No one we've met before this had heard more than rumors if that and we have outrun even rumor in the last month. And all word has to come along the same roads we used, Varen replied. We have moved slowly. Rumor takes wing along a hundred paths. Always plan for the worst, child. That way all your surprises will be pleasant ones. What did he mean about my mother? Elaine said suddenly. He must have been lying. She would never turn against Tarvalon. The queens of Andor have always been friends to Tar Valen, but all things change. Varen's face was calm again, yet there was a tightness in her voice. She turned in her saddle to look over them, the three young women, Hurin, Matt, and the litter. The world is strange, and all things change. They capped the ridge. A village was in sight ahead of them now. Yellow tile roofs clustered around the great bridge that led to Tar Valen. Now you must truly be on your guard, Varen told them. Now the real danger begins. <laughs>